Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Uh, my, I'm Mark Headley. Welcome to another episode of Mark and Mitch Make a Scientology Film. Let's get Mitch in here. There he is. Hey, there Mark. We go. Hey, guys. Hey, Mitch. How's it going, man? Uh, pretty good. It's good. Awesome. Uh, I'm yeah, I'm particularly excited about this uh, film. This was, uh, this was the first film we shot when we got into the big studio. That's right. This um, yeah. this Scientology internal film was called TR Five YTRs. Right. And this, and you're right. We built uh, up until this point. Um, we were shooting at Golden Air Productions. We were shooting in a tiny studio called the Gym, which was a really, really small. It was really not even as big as a TV a standard TV studio. It was very, very small. Um, and then we were shooting at the that Air Force Base uh, called the Norton Air Force Base uh, near near Ontario. And then we were shooting. Um, we built during that whole time in the late 90s, we were building this big giant building at the International Headquarters of Scientology um, called the Cine Castle, the Cinematography Castle. And the castle was about probably about the studio two... itself was 22,000 square feet. The building itself was about 85,000. OK, so. yeah, I mean, the, the studio was about 200. I think it was about 200 yards long and about 100 yards wide. Yeah, it was and, pretty big. And, and, and it was, <clears throat> and as equally as important, it was 60 feet to what they call the grid or the greens up to yeah, where you hold the lights from. Yeah, and it was a free span sound stage. So there were no pillars. It was a steel structure. So right. the entire studio had no supports in the middle of the studio. So you could, <clears throat> you could set up a lot of small sets and you could certainly set up um two or three really really big sets and then also it had a hard or, or, or one ginormous set which is yes. what we did on that's right, right we here. well we yeah. in the studio one corner of the studio was a hard uh what's called a cyclorama or a psych wall and it's one of these ones that <clears throat> excuse me that goes from the floor and then it graduates into the the wall and it's just a, a continuous um surface <clears throat> yeah and we painted that i think want to say we painted that blue we it was it was a big kerfluffle over whether we, it, we would have it as a green screen or we would have it as a blue screen <laughs> and i think I can't remember. I think we actually ended up having it green for yeah. Isaac because um, when you're shooting with um, black people, they have a lot of blue or purple in their uh, skin tones in their skin. And if you shoot them against blue, then it, it's right. really a nightmare with the lighting. So I can't I, I want to say we did a blue screen, but I think we did a green screen with Isaac. Yeah, no, 100 percent. I have some pictures when we it was actually from from the time, second time we shot it. But you can see the and it green was green. Studio. OK, yeah. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. And they used yeah. to they used to tout it as the uh, the biggest green screen at any studio in Southern California, which well, I made that up, so I don't know that. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I was the was one who would do the tours of the studio when we first built it. So I was like, it's the largest free span soundstage in, um, I used to say in California, and then um, one of the largest in the United States is what oh, I would I used say. to say in North America. <laughs> but it was all just, it was like yeah, we was, knew yeah. we'd been to other big stages, and it was yeah. bigger than those. So we were like, yeah, it's one of well, the biggest. I, I mean, it, it, in all fairness, it was in the top 20%. But you're talking about measuring it against studios like Warner Brothers that had 15 stages that were close to that size and then a yeah. few that were bigger. And yeah, so we it was had sort of silly dedicated. that we had the biggest, but we only had yeah. one. <laughs> And we also didn't have the the green screen. We almost didn't have the psychorama because the audio department was convinced that it would ruin the sound. They, they didn't realize that you don't actually record sound in the studio. You record sound in a set in the studio. <laughs> yeah. So it was. I had to fight for that thing. I so remember. I wanted, it was such a nightmare. Yeah, this yeah, building so, and building this thing. Um, there might actually. Um, be another video that I'll do about the construction of this with the construction people that were there at the international headquarters. 
But not only did it take many, many years longer than they planned it to take, it cost millions and millions of dollars more than they thought. And even there was even one single incident of a contractor that was working on the studio. I, I want to say one single contractor stole over $300,000. Just that was one. And there were other things that happened. There was, oh my God, this, it was a shit show building this thing. But regardless, this film, TR5 YTRs, was the very first film that we shot in right. the studio. And, and it was us proving that we could use a studio that size because on the first film, we shot it against the green screen. We used every square inch of it. It was like, you know, there was, you know, because you could you imagine if we had shot a small film inside there, we would have all been like toast. Like we would, yeah, no, oh, yeah. we we this we had so for I for for this film there there's a space platform. The narrator of the film narrates it from a platform, a, a circular platform that's just in space it has its yeah. own atmosphere it has its Somehow, own gravity it's fine. yeah and there's it's not in a, it's not in a it's not in anything it's just on a it's just like if you had a it was a space patio that's essentially what it was it was just it, a space a remote space patio it was a hangout hangout yeah. in space yeah, and it had its own oxygen and it had gravity right. and it had um right. I guess it had light as well. <laughs> yeah, I know it was it was some some future technology that we know nothing about. Um hey, you know, I just remembered I watched your last spy files. You know, our our dear friend Eric Spicer, he he worked on the special effects on this film. He did. He this yeah. was um yeah. well, it's because we had green screen that automatically made every single shot that we shot against a green screen that made it a special effects shot which means right. we got extra points for it yeah yeah i think they're still counting the points from that film <laughs> and but you know what's funny is that um you want to talk about who got cast as the main narrator of the film oh yeah i mean i think and it's how that came to be yeah, I think that's a very, very interesting. Uh, first, I'd like to just mention one thing about the message of the film. Yeah. Get into the cast. Uh, so you have to understand the basic message of this film is the premise of the film is that a 15 year old kid, white kid, because, you know, everybody in Scientology is white pretty much, except for us kids. Um, it, it, he, he comes, he dies, drops the body. He picks up another body on another planet, a, a primitive planet that doesn't have Scientology. And the whole message of the film is that if you don't learn your Scientology now, you might die and come back on a planet without Scientology, and you will be expected to get Scientology going on that planet, and you won't know what you're doing. So you need to spend your time and your money right now during this lifetime making sure that this doesn't happen to you, right? Yeah, so, and not only do you need to know it, you need to know it so well that whatever yeah. you do end up remembering in your next lifetime, it, you yeah. need to know it so well that whatever little you remember, you'll still be able to start Scientology yeah, over you'll start, on a whole nother planet from scratch. Yeah, he helped them to build an e-meter. Um, yes. he, he taught them how to do T-Auras and he gave lectures on Scientology. He taught them how to do assists, like touch assists, feel my finger, which I can't remember what it was in the alien language that we created, but there... People would say it. it would be like da 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 whatever that was. People would actually say that. Yeah, uh, and so, that yeah, was, was the other was thing that crazy. that Mitch worked with the talent department, and they actually there was a book. Um, I was it a book that was written about how they created the the Star Trek. Well, yeah, language? I found no, it wasn't Star Trek. It was another video game. I can't remember the name of it. It was a very popular video game back in the nineties, and it took place on a, on a on a very sort of arboreal civilization kind of you know, kind of a Tolkien-esque but on another planet and they had a, developed that the authors of the game had worked out a basic language so I read that and I realized well this is too much work but based on that we worked out about 200 sounds of, I'm going to back up a second because what Hubbard wrote in the script was they're speaking an alien language but you can't hear them and he would often write these things where, like, make your head spin. They were impossible. Well, how would you know it's an alien language if you can't hear them? But yeah. He says he's speaking in an alien language. So therefore, you have to project that. You have to get that message across. So it's crazy. And you can't just say to Miss Gavage or whoever, oh, this is just crazy. I'm not going to do it that way. You have yeah. to. So, you know, I, I created this language 
And then I said, okay, which way do you want it? Do you want to hear them or not hear them? Then when they see it, they're like, oh, yeah, we want to hear them. So, But you can't ahead of time say that, no, that'll never work. You have yeah, to show. That's right. And I think, and, and from what I remember, at least on the first one, the narrator would do his spiel and then we'd cut away to the kid training the people right. and the right. narrator's VO would still be playing over that. That's and right. you'd hear that language sort of in the background of the uh, narrator. And it track. may fade out or you hear it very low, but yeah, you know, 90% of all of the dialogue in the film, is either Isaac's narration or Isaac on camera. And yes. And there'd just be little clips of, of an exchange and some gobbledygook. That's right. You know, They'd be like, uh, you know, it was like land. It was like Chaka from Land of the Lost. He'd be like, Uga, ta, ta, ta. Exactly. and you'd be like, OK. And that, that was the best one is because even sometimes the kid would mess up in the alien language. He'd he fumble matter. the line. Yeah. And the talent people would be like, oh, he didn't say that. I'd be like, no one. Fucking yeah, it doesn't cares. matter. OK. Yeah. Like, no, no, not once did an actor say, oh, I went up on my lawn. <laughs> yeah. Just, made some stuff up and yeah he wasn't like on. boom chakalaka boom chakalaka and they're like oh no it's boom chakalaka boom and you're like no no it's fine we don't care <laughs> right. okay. but it was very convincing i wish i had a recording of it because it was uh it was really convincing yeah and so everyone so, who had any sort of line in the film would have to practice the the alien language and right. most people only had a line or two the yeah. kid had uh, maybe 20 or 30 lines that he'd have yeah, to he interact had, he had, Yeah, he had to do like public lectures where he might go on for 15 or 20 seconds before yeah. then the, the, the narration would come in. And so, yeah, the narrator was played by Isaac Hayes. Oh, I think we might want to... Uh, yeah, I don't know that, that everybody knows anymore uh, who Isaac Hayes is. Uh, I think we probably... Here, let me just... We probably... There you go. This is Isaac Hayes. He was in this film uh, with um, uh, Nicholas Cage and, and, uh, and Bridget Fonda called It Could Happen to You. This was a few years before we made this film with Isaac. Yeah. And in, in the film, he plays the, uh, the, news, the guy at the corner who, who sells newspapers in a stand, like in Manhattan. He's, his name is Angel something, and he's actually an angel, and he's the one who narrates this film. Nice. Occasionally he comes in and he tells stories and, and, but tr he's acting behind the scenes as like a supernatural force making the story happen. It's a really lovely romantic comedy. If you've never seen it, it's worth watching. And I'd seen this film and I was really impressed with Isaac's performance. And then when I got this, a hold of this script, I was like, Hey, we're going to make this movie um, or this film. You don't call them movies. Uh, Movies are what people watch when they eat popcorn. At least this yes. is way more serious. Uh, remember, you kind of get in trouble for calling it a movie. People look at you like, that's not a movie, that's a film. That's right. It actually was, that was a real thing. If you called a yeah. Scientology um, film a movie, it was sort of like disrespecting the film. Yeah. This is L. Ron Hubbard's technology. Yeah. And um, it was just. If you called like, it a okay. video, it was even worse. But, yeah. <laughs> but either way, um, when we yeah, I, I i i really liked his performance and so when i got the script yeah i thought oh you know this you know the the, the script described this guy as a wise old spaceman with a, a white beard and white hair you know kind of like gandalf without a hat like an yeah. old wizardy kind of guy and I, and, and I thought i just met isaac and i saw i remember this film and i went oh let's do i that would be so much that would just be cool to have this this wise old spaceman being played by you know, black uh, Moses and uh, Isaac was just beloved individual, an Oscar winning uh, singer songwriter. And he'd acted in probably 20 or 30 films. As a matter of fact, that's how he got into Scientology. Yeah. And I was going to say at this time, um, we hadn't really shot with a lot of uh, black actors in Scientology no. and specifically in the films. We had Michael D. Roberts and then whatever int base staff would play little right. background or just in terms a, of uh, real actors. I mean, the only not, two yeah. was Isaac and Michael. Yeah. And so, um, and David Miscavige during this time was making a definite, uh, definite effort to show the black community that there were black Scientologists and there were black celebrities and this thing. So, I mean, Mitch could do no wrong su suggesting that Isaac play this yeah, main part. Yeah. It was just like, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, I just want to add to that, that essentially what was happening is that 
Scientology was becoming so hated amongst white culture that Miscavige was looking for white American culture that he was looking for other types of communities, kinds of communities uh, to bring, introduce Scientology to because he thought they were less PTS, like he wanted to open Russia and China, you know, because he felt that these other countries reputational um, uh, function of, you know, the reputational negativity of Scientology hadn't caught up with us yet. So he was starting to go after the black folks. Um, and I, I unwittingly, I helped him do that. Yeah. So Isaac was the main um, actor, right. the narrator. Right. And then the, 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 the kid who's born on this other planet, that actor and the first time we shot, this was played by, um, a Scientology child actor named Johnny Lewis. And Johnny Lewis, I mean, uh, we shot this around the 2000, like around 2000 or 19. Yeah, I think we shot it in uh, 1999. Two, I think it was 2000. Yeah, so uh, I think so Johnny Dan, was, he was 15. Yeah, f yeah, 15 or 16. Whenever we shot yeah. it, I, I know he yeah. was, um, yeah, he was, he was a, he was in his. He was a teenager, regardless of if he was fifteen yeah, yeah. or sixteen and or seventeen. We'd done a couple of things with him. He was a terrifically talented young man. And then he actually went on, um, not related um, to Jeffrey Lewis or Juliet Lewis. No. His father, his mother and father were people, uh, were Scientologists that um, they got people into Scientology. They kind of did. They were professional Scientologists. Yeah, they were. They did introductory auditing and counseling with people, and then they would get them in to Scientology. And yeah, that was. I, I think his mom ran a school. Isn't that right? Did she run one of the Scientology schools for a while? I think she either did tutoring she, at one of those schools or worked she, at one I of those think, schools. Wasn't she the Lewis and Lewis Carroll? Um, she may have been. I don't. Yeah. I didn't know a lot about his mom. I knew his dad did yeah. these seminars at l the Celebrity Center on how to get people in, yeah. or how to land commercials, or right. how to have a successful family. Um, oddly enough, um, Johnny ended up be um, kind of not doing a lot in Scientology, really, but he grew up in it, and then. Right. He became a professional actor, and he was on TV shows and did films. And I think he, he ended up getting a part on um, Sons of Anarchy. Yeah, he was and then, one of the co-stars of Sons of Anarchy. And he was actually one of the favorite characters on there. In terms of the fan base, they loved Johnny Lewis. I mean, he was... Yeah. And then he ended up yeah. having... Um, he had a motorcycle accident, and from the motor, after the motorcycle accident... It just went from bad to worse very quickly. He ended up getting, having mental issues and getting arrested multiple times. And yeah. um, and every time he would get a, arrested, it was, I think it was usually because he was either breaking into somebody's house. Um, uh, he, I, I think the first time he, after the motorcycle accident, he broke into somebody's house and the person whose house he broke into almost beat him to death. And, and then, that he they thought he was on drugs he had no drugs in his system i, I want to say that every single time he got arrested for assault or one of these episodes he they thought they assumed that he was on drugs and he right. wasn't and then ended up um he ended up um unaliving himself and his landlord in the his hollywood landlady. yeah it was really a tragedy his uh yeah his landlady and, who was actually very well known in the actor community in hollywood yeah he had she had rented up a living space to a lot of struggling like bungalows actors. to writers and actors. Yeah, in to LA. later. I mean, these are people that later became successful, and so she was a very well-known, liked person. And unfortunately, Danny had complete. I mean, uh, Johnny, 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 Danny. I mean, you know, they were they were about. No, I guess Danny was older than Johnny. Yeah, but uh, but either yeah, way, he tragic. played the main character. Yeah, in this film did a great job i must say he was besides great. the narrator and he was great and also he was a kid when we were shooting with him and he was right. <clears throat> i think he'd done some commercials or something like that at that point or been some bit parts here and there and he'd been in tons of stuff we did we would use yeah. him as like a a, a accounts uh, like someone being counseled or just a yeah, good looking he was, he was a good looking era. white kid so yeah he was he, one, of, one of the golden era players <laughs> yeah golden era players <laughs> That's exactly what we should call them from now on. Yeah, yeah. The golden era players. We should start Jim collecting Eskimen. photos. Of, 
Tate Rupert. Yeah, we'll we'll get we're gonna show. Yeah. Let's do that for the next video. We'll get together a a little slide a a deck. Yeah. A slide deck. Don't forget we had Jen Elfman did a couple of things with us. We put her in there. Before before Dave told us she looked like uh uh Yeah. Yeah, what's the girl from The Exorcist, Linda Blair. Before he said she looked like Linda Blair. We had a bunch of people. We had we we had uh, Bonnie, Bonnie's sister. We almost had Bonnie, but it, it just the time he never worked out. Uh, so yeah, we, yeah, we had Rebe- uh, Marissa Rabisi. We did use right. his sister, right. and then right. we did. Um, we we I don't think we ever did anything with Kirsty. Uh, we never we did inter- anything. We we did some interviews with. Kirstie, yeah, that's true. Never Jennifer. any film. We didn't ever no. roll film on her. No. I don't think we interviewed her and Travolta and a bunch of people, but. That's a different thing. I, I yeah. will think of more. I know Mike we will. Carmen, very good actor. Jason Michael Begay. Fairman. <laughs> yeah, Jason, Jason. Tate Rupert, okay. Jim Eskimen, right. Kelly Daniels. And then, yeah. What's her name? Denise uh, Stuff. I think, yeah, I can't think of it. Denise's uh, friend, the soap opera actress. Michelle you know, Stafford? Uh, Michelle Stafford. We did Michelle, shoot a lot with her videos yeah. with her in the early days. Yeah, she was Michelle, an, I think she did how to Dianetics how to stuff. No, she didn't do that. But maybe she did the first one. Oh, no, that was Lee Purcell. Oh, Lee Purcell. Lee Purcell. Right. That was Lee her Purcell. name. So somebody sent me a link to the Dianetics how to video. The first and, one from 90. Yeah, the very first one and Lee Purcell, Lee Purcell is the star of that one for yeah, sure. She's a, a, a thing about Lee Purcell. She's one of the people I spoke about was referring to the other day. I did a short for, from a thing I did with uh, Karen De La Carey about why so many Scientologists actors don't make it because yeah. they put so much attention on Scientology and they spend so much money that they sort of forgot their careers. And Lee Purcell is a perfect example. Lee Purcell was the female lead in John Milius's Big Wednesday, which is an amazing film that everybody should watch this weekend. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this, this film, I can tell you stories about this film endlessly. But she's the family. She's literally the emotional center of this, of John Milius's first. You know, this is the guy who wrote Apocalypse Now, and he yeah, did, he did Red Dawn and all these great films. And she's amazing. She's the emotional center of Big Wednesday. She's an incredible actress, and she just I don't know what happened to her. But a big shout out to Lee Priscilla. I hope you're doing okay. So yeah, okay. So then. Um... Do you want to show some of the pictures? That's sort of the we've set up the 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 well, story I, you know, of wanna, the film. Uh, yeah, but I want there's one other story that we talked about that we should relay. It's like when when I didn't I didn't know what uh, Isaac's current circumstances were when when we cast him in the film. I knew he was. I heard he's living in New York. I didn't know. I didn't know. Oh, that's that, right. Uh, that he was living in New York. Not living in New York. But he had a radio show that was like the most popular radio show in New York. And he did the show every day, Monday through Friday. That's he right. said, I'd love to do the film, but I, I only, I'm only free on weekends. And so we were like, that's cool. We'll shoot it on weekends. And I was like, no, no, I don't get to go home. So <laughs> well, well, also we because we had to put that giant set in the studio. Right. We could only shoot other sets in the other direction or right. not near that psych wall. Right. We so we ended it. up having to kind of do a bunch of smaller sets that we'd shoot during the week right. and then have everything ready Friday night right. so that the second that Isaac showed up on Saturday, then we could just start rolling. And But unfortunately... Whenever Isaac would get there, we'd have these pages and pages of dialogue that he needed to do right. that was written by L. Ron Hubbard. And the right. way this flowery kind of weird prose way that L. Ron Hubbard wrote this, the dialogue for Isaac, it, he couldn't, he, it was so unnatural for him to read these words yeah, in it this was just like arrangement a, a that we would, cultures. we would have to make each... It was really weird because because you have to shoot exactly. You cannot alter the L. Ron Hubbard uh, dialogue. Right. That's a, that's not a that's right. a that's sort of a that would be a crime for us. Oh yeah, um, if, as if a the Sea Org members. If, if there's a if there's a contraction like I mean if there's a, it is you cannot say it's you cannot make a contraction out of two words. That's exactly that, what I was going to say. So Isaac would do the whole thing of, perfect. 
but he'd he'd say an it's instead of an it is, or he'd say a let's instead of let us, and then yeah, it would be like that. No cut, we got to re and yeah. and 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 this was the weird thing because um, you have Mitch. Mitch is a, uh, is essentially he's the boss of the film team. But at the same right. time, if a person on the film team, they're responsible, like the sound guy's responsible for the sound and the script, we, what we called a script supervisor was in charge of, if, if it says, let us see what we're talking about, and right. he says, let's, then the script supervisor, w sometimes the, the, the person who was the script supervisor, she would just yell, cut, just like, cut. Yeah, which is completely, even in, on a Scientology set, is illegal because the only two people it says it's mandated. It's like in Hollywood, but it's an unspoken rule. The only two people that can yell cut is an assistant director or the director. Nobody else is allowed to yell cut. Yeah. I mean, in Hollywood, so you would just be fired for doing it. That's right. So every once in a while, um, somebody would do they that. They can help themselves. Yeah, like a sound guy would be like cut. It was it, and it, and and if you're if you're not the sound guy and you understand how film works and how takes work and all this, if we say the wrong part on the first part of the shot, the the second part of the shot could still be usable if we cut to it or if we just use the VO yeah. track or if we need it, we can still use it. You don't have to cut because your right. department. But but L. Ron Hubbard says that each person and if you don't cut, there's a weird thing where yeah, he kind of no, sets it up. Everybody's made. It's it's like the, what did you do to pull it in thing. Everybody is made to be responsible. It's really hard to direct there, because everybody is so responsible. As yes. opposed to having one person that says, okay, here's where we're at. Here's what we're gonna do. Blah blah blah. It's really, it's really like the credit for the film says written. It says produced and directed by Golden Era Production. Yeah, and there's no it's, other credits. Well, I, I besides I L. Ron Hubbard, it. written and di written screenplay by L. Ron Hubbard, written by yeah. L. Ron Hubbard, yeah, produced and directed by Golden Air Productions. Yeah, and sometimes <laughs> it would say musical score by L. Ron. Hubbard. Yes, <laughs> musical score by L. Ron Hubbard, and then music produced, or no, they wouldn't even say the music. They would just say produced and directed by Golden Air, and that's just everything yeah. else. Right. Yeah. No, no, no credits. Nobody. The, no, yeah. There's no. There's no costumes, Actors, wardrobe, uh, talent. Not, not, no one has a credit. So, but what ended up happening was we would, we had these shots where we're like, okay, this paragraph's a shot, this paragraph's a shot, this paragraph, and we couldn't do that anymore. So we had to break, essentially we had to break every single sentence into its own shot because that's the only way we couldn't gang up sentences for, for Isaac to do. He, and, and we wouldn't stop rolling. He would say it wrong and we'd go, do it again. Or we'd read, read the line back to him and have him just keep read it back. And, it's, and what we planned to shoot in a weekend took us, I think, three or four weekends to shoot with Isaac. Maybe even more. I yeah, can't I remember, remember how many times he ended up coming back, but it was way more than we had planned. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't remember how many it was. All I know is one of those weekends was on my birthday. And I was really mad about that because I didn't get to go home and I had to shoot. I've done that in the past a number of times for some reason. Wah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? But, you know, when you've got little kids, when you have little kids and they're like, Daddy, are you coming for your birthday? You know. Okay, never mind. You know, okay. It's, you know. No, I, I dig it. I couldn't imagine when I was there, Mitch, there was so many times where I had like a – a, a crisis of faith and like I need Mitch to stay here but I know he has a wife and two children and they don't yeah. see him until the weekend and if he doesn't yeah. go on the weekend yeah. they don't see him at all okay but and, listen I wasn't upset so the thing that upset me yeah was not that it was my birthday I think yeah. I, my my former wife and my still are my children yeah um, I, I I think they came up what really upset me was that the crew arranged with Isaac in his costume at dinner time. They all marched into the dining room where I was, and he sang me happy birthday. He almost like, sat me in his lap. It was the most amazing thing to have Isaac as sing you uh, happy birthday. And I'm looking around. Nobody's got a camera. Nobody's videoing it. There's nothing. It's just like never happened. So yeah. that's what I'm pissed. I'm that, pissed that off is... about that. That is, there, God, there, I, I, there were a lot of things that happened at that property that it would have been amazing if we had cameras yeah, rolling. And, and usually things like that, they'd want a video. You know, they'd want it for PR reasons, just internal PR. You know, Miss Gadge would love to see that. Oh, look, Isaac's seen the director. 
happy birth or something, but it's like, you know what, I wasted 30 years of my career and I didn't even get a photo of Isaac <laughs> Hayes? What? Anyway, so, um, yeah. But, you know, when you mentioned that he couldn't do his lines, it's not because we didn't try to rehearse them. And remember how we, you know, how we got him? I mean, how did he, remember how we got from New York to L.A. every week? Oh, yeah, so I, Tommy Davis would fly to New York. What, what Tommy who? A lot of people don't know who he was. Tommy Davis, at the time, he was he was sort of like the senior um, at the in the in Scientology. They have a place called the Celebrity Center, and the Celebrity Center is located in Hollywood, California, right. and that's the place that's responsible for recruiting celebrities into Scientology. Right, and, and yeah, and Tommy and Davis, their family and their agents, and their, yeah, yeah, anybody in the industry who might have something to do yeah. with yeah. Hollywood is considered. Uh, public a Scientologist yeah, of yeah. Celebrity Center, if they or can it could be in. sports, it could be business. If you were like a rich, that's true. Guy. Any opinion leader in the arts yeah. or entertainment, yeah. or uh, you're right, it could be if they're well known, even if they're just have some celebrity of any faction. Yeah, if, if uh, in other words, if you weren't just a garden variety schmuck, you could be public at Celebrity Center. Yeah. So. so Tommy Davis is the son of Ann Archer, who is a, a very fam uh, famous actress um, and also a Scientologist. And she, I mean, she was in, um, what's that movie with um, Michael one, Douglas? Uh, oh, yes, the, 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 the one with Sharon Stone. The, no, Fatal, Attraction. Sure, she, uh, Fatal Attraction. Ann Archer was the wife in Fatal Attraction, the one with... She's um, an Oscar-nominated actress. I believe. Yeah, the one with uh, Michael Douglas and what uh, Glenn Close, the one where yeah. Michael Douglas has an affair and then um, Glenn Co Close is just a couple sandwiches short of a picnic <laughs> and comes after uh, Michael Douglas yeah. and his wife, right. played by Ann Archer. Um, so she was the... Uh, Tommy Davis was her son, I can't right. remember his dad's name, something Davis. Oh, uh, yeah, he, um, he was, you mean his stepdad or his real father? His, his real dad was, uh, like, in the financial... Uh, yeah, yeah, he was a billionaire. Uh, in, in, yeah, in, he's uh, had Street, a big, too. I think, hedge fund or Wall yeah, Street yeah. or something like that. Financial guru, um, Dr. Big Bucks. And then um, Ann Archer ended up marrying Terry Jastro, a very famous golf uh, uh, celebrity kind of producer friend. Yeah, he of was. Yeah, he was like Nicholas a, a multi, multi, multi Emmy award winning sports producer. I think for ABC, and his specialty was golf, and he did a lot of lot of that stuff. Yeah, so they were both in Scientology. Tommy Davis um, was um, Ann's son, and he joined the Sea Org. I want to say in his teens, like 15, no, no, 16. No, no, no. He was two years in Columbia College. He was a huge oh. flop. He was he was gonna he was at Columbia in New York. Okay. Two years in, he quit, and his father was like, "Blah!" You know, his head like exploded. Like, and so quit. he escaped that to go live with Anne. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he <laughs> was in one of the best colleges in America. Uh, you know, and he's just come on. He's just groomed to be like, a, you know, a, a super successful, financially secure, a son of a uh, of, of a movie star and a and a hedge fund manager, and he quits to go and be like a celebrity wrangler at Celebrity Center. Like, that was really yeah. his job. So he was he probably was, he was probably 19 or 20, actually, when he... Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, two years into college, you'd be like... Yeah, so he, when he was younger, he used to do services at the Beverly Hills Mission. Oh. And so Claire's that father... place was a hotbed of controversy. Well, uh, yes, yeah. and Claire's father was the executive director of the Beverly Hills Mission, and right, she would go right. there and do Scientology stuff too, and Tommy Davis would be there when she would oh, be there. Oh, so she knew Tommy now, when he folks, was a, when he was right. a young teenager. And one of the things that came up, and I always remember this, is that um, he had dabbled in uh, marijuana. Oh my God! As a teenager, and that is a um, a disqualification to be in religious technology center. If you if you are in Scientology and then you do drugs, it's called being a drug revert. And it's mm -hmm. and you can't be a drug revert if you go and want to go into religious technology center. Right. And so there was a law uh, there was a long period of time where Tommy Davis was that now he 
he's in the Sea Org. He becomes a Celebrity Center Sea Org member, and then he starts handling these high level celebrities. And it's like it, it's a natural sort of progression that you would end up in Religious Technology Center and then do that job from there. And the reason well, also, I was, was told, really pretty, he was really pretty. Yeah, he so was he, very he, personable, he was, is what we called it in Sea Org. <laughs> and, and Miscavige liked to decorate. He liked decorative staff, right? He liked or, ornaments, ornamental staff. Is what, and, and, and so Tommy was perfect for that. Yeah, like and he, Tommy... He could introduce him as, this is Tommy Davis, Ann Archer's kid. Did you know she was nominated for an Oscar? Like, whatever bullshit... He yeah, out like that, like that was his thing. Sorry, Mark, I I got you. no. It's good, and also Tommy Davis because his parents were wealthy. By proxy, he was wealthy, so he was in oh, yeah. the Sea Org member, but he was independently. He drove a BMW. Yeah. Oh no, he, no, he didn't. Drive he had a, a fifteen. He drove like a hundred and fifty thousand dollar BMW. <laughs> Mitch yeah. is like, so, I had a seven series. Tommy had the oh, best he, one of whatever he, I had. Yeah, well, it was only when I had little kids because my wife said it was a safe car, and I drive <laughs> hundred, two hundred miles a week. Okay. Anyway, so, but yeah, no, regardless, was insanely for, rich. Yeah. he was walking around with a watch that would be five years of Sea Org wages. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a watch that that's how much yeah. to, to wear the watch yeah. Tommy Davis wore. I'd have to save up as a Sea Org member for five years and not spend a penny to get that watch. So yeah, and eventually he became the international spokesman and foot in mouth in charge of the Church of Scientology. This guy he, we called him the foot bullet, Mr. Foot bullet. Yeah. That's actually yeah. what we called him um, on the outside. We'd say, hey, did Mr. Foot bullet, what, is Mr. Foot bullet gonna be on something? Wow, this is gonna be yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, so yes, um, so that's Tommy Davis. So Tommy Davis would fly to New York, pick up on Isaac Friday. Friday on Friday. Friday morning, he fly to New York. I think they would fly in the red, they would fly back. Fly back on a red eye, yeah. And, on the and red, then, yeah. But on Isaac the way back, be... he, he drill his lines. I always wondered what that was like. You know, nonstop, you've got like whatever, four or five ever flight. And, you know, you've got Tommy Davis sitting next to you, you know, making you do your lines for, I mean, you know, I mean come on, give the guy a break. So uh, by the time Isaac got to, to us, he was just fried because he'd been. Well, also, he never knew his lines. A at least whatever he knew, yeah. he would fumble. So it's almost it's like totally. we would be like, um, t uh, we're here to shoot, and Isaac's got to get his lines done. And the person that's been assigned to get Isaac through his lines is Tommy. And right. Tommy's like, hey, we got to go. We got to do this. We got to do this. And it's like, hey, bitch, your one job was to have this guy ready. He ain't ever been yeah. ready anytime yeah. he's ever yeah. come here. So right. what, what uh, are you doing? Like, he was yeah. sort of like, and also Tommy just hung out while we were working. So he it wasn't like he was doing anything. He was just kind of sitting around on his phone or go he'd go in the lounge and it would sort of be like yeah you had one job dude and you didn't do it at all and so don't kind of tell us like hey we got to hurry up isaac's got to yeah, leave exactly. in this amount of times yeah. be like dude the reason it's taking forever is because of you okay <laughs> yeah exactly no that's 100 percent true you want to show some of these pics now or uh, yeah, is there okay, anything so, else we need to set up? I, I mean, that's well, pretty know, I, much. I, I don't know if I don't know if you still have it. I, I have it somewhere, but what? We did right find that. Yeah, but no, we found that one little piece of video of Isaac on the space platform. It was in that little sequence from the gold video. Oh yeah, I don't know where that is, but um, yeah, well, it's in that. It's uh, it's in the video that you did on your channel. Yeah, but if you want to look, there's did. a shot, and we've showed it before. There's a shot okay. of Isaac on um this yeah, on the space long, anyway. on the space patio <laughs> yeah the space patio so here's uh here's a shot this is uh, i had to sneak these with my cell phone because they they don't allow cameras on the set so this is one of the few little groups of shots i have you can see the blue screen you can see our like fake rock set it looked pretty green good screen camera. in this case yeah, it sorry. is a green yeah, screen yeah green screen right 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 what the hell am i saying so and yeah, the and these people are dressed like the, the their this is the timeless the the uniforms for this were timeless oh look you, uh, the, <laughs> that, that's because you I, did this I did quotes and then they're yeah. like yeah that's two that's two peace signs that equals balloons yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway um, they were the timeless uniforms and I guess this is what the costumes department well this interpreted. Yeah, this thing 
this thing had a kind of a steampunk motif, you know, yes. which was weird because it was supposed to be a, a kind of primitive plant with just enough technology that maybe they could whip together an e-meter. Yes. Uh, and uh, these were a couple <laughs> yeah. of soldiers. Uh, these these were the guys, one of them gave the other one a touch. It says, apparently they, they had wars on this planet because all of a sudden in the middle of the, of the, of the planet of the middle of the movie, there's like explosions in the background and there's these two guys, one of them's injured behind a rock and the other one's giving him assist. It just, it, it kind of didn't make a lot of sense, but I went with it. This is the kid, this is the kid who actually replaced Johnny Lewis after Johnny's tragic. He demise. looks like Johnny a little bit too. Yeah, he does. And he's wearing a very similar costume, same color. Yeah. And um, the, the, the environment is kind of intended to be like post-apocalyptic, like a society that's, Coming up after a post-apocalyptic event, you know, you have to create layers and layers of history if you're going to make a film. It needs to have everything needs to have a backstory, even the environment. So if it's supposed to take place in a semi-primitive or semi-mechanistic society in, the, in some other planet, you have to envision its future. I'm sorry, its past. Like you have to kind of be a little bit of an archaeologist. So a lot of the film takes place in ruins or in structures that were made from previous levels of technology. You yes. Know, you get kind of bent of this shit. So I also remember when we shot this because um, David Miscavige um, has asthma. And right, so right. whenever he would come, when, it, when we were yeah, getting we this- Yeah, we used a lot of smoke. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, <laughs> we were excited. getting the studio ready. Um, he would come down. It was be, it, the- as the as the structure was being built, um, it was it was just sand or dirt in the middle of the studio, and only when the entire structure was built did they finish the concrete because they didn't want the concrete to be damaged by steel or heavy equipment right. driving around in there. So the entire building was built. The very last thing we did was pour the concrete in the middle of the studio. Right. So there was dust and dirt all up in the rafters and the grid and on the walls and on the fabric. And so every single time David Miscavige would come to the studio, he would he would walk in and go, nope, it's too dirty in here, and he would leave. And we would always be like, how does he know it's dirty in here? Well, it's because he has- a man with asthma. Well, because he had asthma, so if it was, if there was a lot of particulate in the air, dirt or dust particulate in the air, he was very, very sensitive to it. So we had to white glove the studio, white glove the studio, white glove. We kept having to clean and clean and clean. I think we vacuumed for like two months to get all the dirt and dust. And we had to use these special um, L. Ron Hubbard recommended vacuums that are called rainbows that have water oh in them. So God. the dirt goes oh through God. the water and it doesn't then blow dirt back out the exhaust. Of the, it was a whole thing, trust me. Anyway. So then when we went to go shoot this film, it's all like post-apocalyptic. So we have to bring all these um, sets in there and then we have to dump dirt and sand on everything. Yeah, I, plus, I, I shot with smoke a lot. I mean, if you look at this photo, you'll see. Well, you'll see, look at this one. Look at all this sand and dirt on the ground yeah. in the photo. Yeah. So then I was like, are you kidding? We spent two months cleaning this place and now we're gonna bring sand and dirt back in here and dump it all over everything. <laughs> anyway, but yes, and we did also shoot with a lot of fog and um so yeah yeah this was david miscavige the... when I, at least what the first few years that we built the studio um david miscavige did not come by that no, often no. It, when we first no, built never... it he kind of came by a little bit just to see but then after once we got working um he would stay away because it was oh, still yeah. just too dirty and smoky and whatever was there was just too much for him well to be also able to remember deal. there were also people in sets that he busted out of his own his That's true. Yeah, <laughs> the he whole of the whole of <laughs> yeah, the whole of the shoot crew were people that used to work for either management and had to deal with him, or used to work yeah. in religious technology center. Yeah, and he kicked me, out. <laughs> yeah, the, me, the cameraman, and the and me, the, you and the lighting guy, and uh, like the five of us. The make yeah, a film, we were the on, only ones that were like on, uh, organically just in the cinematography yeah, area. Then, we weren't. <laughs> yeah, you remember that one time everybody went to an event, and then we stayed behind and got a bunch of shots done for a big film. Yes, and, it was and, like four or five of us, even even that. And it turned out that the that we were the only ones that were actually needed to make a film because. <laughs> 
everybody else was kind of in the way. Yeah, I just for what we were out, shooting. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to point out this set was supposed to be the kind of future, this kind of futuristic, but the, a lab where they actually put together an e-meter, like a steampunk version of an e-meter. Yeah, you know, and, in the first one, we didn't have a nice lab like that, I don't think. we. No, everything you, no, was... Yeah, no, there was. There was absolutely. Uh, but no, wasn't it was. in a cave? No, it was, it was, um, it was, no, it was just not as elaborate as this. I mean, well, that's what I'm saying. We didn't have any, yeah, this is no, a very, it, it was, very, no, we, uh, we got, heavily I, produced I, set. Oh yeah, I know. And there's big, there's big fans in the ceiling spinning around with light being interrupted and there's machines everywhere. This thing was crazy, man. We like, you know, I would spend as much money as they would let me possibly spend. Here he is. Which uh, wasn't fashion. a lot. <laughs> No, I mean, well, when you have a huge set shop, you have 30 people in sets and they're working for nothing. Yeah. You can make a film look like, you know, multi, multi million dollar film because uh, that's just, you know. Totally. And, you know. and for one of these films, I should say this, I don't know if we've ever said this, but one of these um, film, these training films that we do, depending on the sets and the talent and all that good stuff, we could shoot it for from start to finish, from pre-production to final, uh, you know, online edit or yeah. final film answer print or whatever the um, end of the line was, depending on what f formats and media that we were shooting on, we could shoot one of these for anywhere from a hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. Oh, sometimes fifty grand. Yeah, I well, mean, but, it, 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 but the fifty I grand was. Yeah, but then I'm not including you. In some of those, yeah, no, figures. no, no, but they don't include me. That's a whole different thing. They don't. Yeah, include, uh, all labor is not in the budget. Yeah, there's it's no labor. Yeah, that's that's what's just what I was going to say. Not in the budget. It's Out of that free. three hundred thousand, there's no labor fee. There's yeah. no. Yeah. It's only it's only um, actors. And then if we need um like if we need an an if we need animals we need an, uh, like an animal wrangler or we have to hire a what do they call it um, picture animals whatever. Um, that's what they that, call them picture that, animals. Picture animals. Okay, so if we had to hire picture or a animals. Or picture car or a car or maybe we need some real fancy piece of uh, equipment like a like a Techno Porsche crane. crane or yeah, a, yeah dragon, like a dragon, dragon crane, crane or a techno blah, blah, blah. crane. Or... Yeah, I mean, in the industry, you have two costs. They have above the line and below the line. And below the line yeah. are all your, 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 like your director, your script writer, you know, all your creative stuff. Above the line, you've got all the rest of the talent. And that's like, you, uh, in a lot of cases, that's your biggest item. But you take that out. Yeah, in the, the gold budget, they just completely take that out. So let me. Uh, here's the best way to explain this: is a thing called production value, which most people don't know what that is. Most people think, you know, like Avatar. Wow, the production value of Avatar is incredible. But it actually, Avatar has zero production value because it costs half a billion dollars to make, and it looks like it costs half a billion dollars to make. So it's the difference between what it looks like to make and what it actually costs. That's your production value. So uh, by that metric, Goldner Productions has the greatest production value of any studio in the world because they're the only studio in the world that is that has managed to accumulate world-class equipment, very talented people, and they work as slaves. And that's essentially what gives you a lot of production value. Yeah, you know, you you're getting a, you're getting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of labor and product. Yeah, totally for totally. for free. So yeah, so you're making a film. And Mark says three hundred thousand dollars. You're talking about a film that looks like it should cost two to five million dollars. Like that's yeah. an absolute fact. And also all of the crew. So so yes, you're right. So not only are we not really we're, and and the talent that we did use for the most of the time we used. For a lot of the years, we just did it under the table. It was just like we just paid day rates, just yeah, just li very Not union minimal. Talent. Yeah. yeah, the very minimal day rate, like an eighty dollars a day actor. Yeah, kind whatever of thing. it was. The, uh... And then, and then, in well, the, then they ran into in... the. There's issues with like California labor laws. So you can't just be paying people under the table. So then they had to give them legitimate payroll, and they didn't know how to do that. And yeah, I I ran my own company before I went to gold. I had a a contract with a payroll company because nobody does their own. Only big studios like Paramount or whatever do their own payroll. Everybody else, there's a bunch of payroll services in Hollywood and yeah. they help keep track of residuals and blah, blah, blah. So then they ran all their payroll through my company, which scared the bejesus out of me because <laughs> that granted me the legal right to control the material if they weren't paying people. 
Really? I didn't know that Yeah, that like happened. if they didn't pay people, I could have said, that's mine. You can't use it. You can't play it on TV. If they didn't pay residuals to actors, then who, whoever did the payroll, they gained control of it, legal control of it. Wow. Um, so I didn't that, know that. Oh, yeah. That just scared the hell out of me. So then eventually I, I got them. I was like, no. And then they made a deal with, I don't know, cast and crew or one of the companies to, to do that. And they, you know, they run their if it's talent payroll, which involves uh, conforming to SAG rules or, you know, having to do with residuals, blah, blah, blah. They have to run it through a payroll company or they're just yeah. like it. And they hate that shit because that's like so planet Earth problems. Like, Yeah. You know, well, the thing I was going to say is, so not only did we pay, we paid a decent amount for the talent, but it was the bare minimum amount that could be paid. Yeah, and absolutely. Then, and yeah. then, but then in addition to that, not only are you getting the sets and the wardrobe and uh, props and all that, you're getting all that free labor, but the camera crew, the lighting crew, the grip crew, anybody... Um, including visual effects and on-set right. effects, all of those trades were Sea Org members. So you weren't right. paying for any labor on any right. part of this film. And then same thing with post-production, all of the editing, all of that, of the, the film lab. By the time we had the Cine Castle, we also had an entire film produ production lab that you could process film through so that we didn't have to drive the film to Los Angeles. It could all be done at the property. Right, and, and actually it was done at higher quality than they do in Hollywood. So, yeah, well, yeah, because we were only doing our own stuff. We weren't slopping yeah. everybody else's stuff through the same yeah, chemical baths. Yeah, it wasn't baths done for and, profit, but so it was like... Yeah, it was done at a huge loss. It, and that yeah, is the other thing. They didn't... The money that they saved was spent on a $30 million cine castle, cinematography castle. Yeah, or so. <laughs> they didn't have to spend. They had it for PIs and lawyers. And, yeah, it's and ridiculous. People down and, you know, like that. they don't try to get deals on that stuff. Yeah, yeah, well, I know. Okay, it's so, yeah. it's so, it's so hypocritical. They're they ain't saving yeah. money on lawsuits. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's really crazy. Is there another so, slide in this? Yeah, there's. I think there's a few of them. Oh yeah, yeah look at that set. Oh, that's a yeah. two storyer. Yeah, it was. Huge. Uh, is that was... is that background? Is that uh, practical? Can you walk up there? Can people be yeah. up there? The scaffold. Yeah, there there was scenes where people were working up there. So here's what happened around the time when we made this one. Is that a person so, up there behind them? Is that a person up there? Yeah, that is somebody. That's somebody up on the catwalk. It was 100. Wow. Years ago. I I have a. a I should converted it to an AF, AF or whatever, a different city. Oh that. my gosh. I'm, I'm seeing what you're talking about. The ceiling is the actual catwalk. Yeah, it's the catwalk. The ceiling the is the, the yeah. grid where all the power and lights and everything right, are up there. Right, And the floor is the cement floor in the studio. I had to polish it and, and put a finish on it. So that's wow. the actual studio floor. That's you know, very I, cool. I like that. Yeah, because, you know... It, 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 I tried to get them not to do a cement floor because all of their their staff are going to be crippled in their old age because you're not supposed to work on cement. Oh, it was so rough it's, on it's on the staff. It was so and, rough on the crew. Yeah, and nobody uses cement in, in in studios in big studios. They use what are called live wood floors uh, for two reasons. For one thing, and it's a very specialized way you build it so that they don't squeak. Uh, but do it for two reasons. One, just because it's better for people's health. But you can also drill into the floor because when you're putting sits down and stuff. Yeah. And so when you usually go into a studio, like a big studio at Warner Brothers or Paramount, the floors are just destroyed uh, because everybody's screwing into them. And, and every so many years, they pull the floor up and replace it. And Gold were like, no, 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 no. We can't have our floor ever look bad because, you know, they were more concerned about the their reputation, they're like bringing big wigs on tours. Uh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. And so they, and I was so pissed that they made it cement because I knew how dangerous it is for people's, you know, their, their, their body. It's just really bad to work on cement all day long. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, but I used to then make them all the shit and use it in the set. This is like yeah. a third of the screen screen guy. It I was going to say, so this huge. is, yeah, so you can see here, just this is a, I mean, this is not a, a frame that was in the film, but you can just see the crane. So you've got a crane on a dolly there, on a dolly track, and then you've got all those psych lights against the psych wall. 
at the top of the right. frame, and then you've got those right. uh, those big uh, kind of uh, diffusion for the lights yeah. up top. And but that's and speaking a, of uh, using speaking of a lot. Money, there was a big camera equipment, a, 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 a crane equipment company in Hollywood, and they donated that crane. It's a really good crane. They ended up with extra equipment, and they needed. They actually donated two cranes to Gold. Was that and Roberts? They get a t- no, 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 no. This was just completely independent, nothing to do with Scientology. But it was a legitimate tax write-off for them. They needed to get rid of this equipment, and they were better off donating it to a nonprofit. Yeah. Than they were, there, you know, there's no nonprofit. You know, Gold is like the only nonprofit film studio. <laughs> So, yeah, you know, it, it turns out to be a good place for people to donate equipment to get rid of scuttled bad yeah. equipment that they can't. They don't want to keep yeah. on the bu- the books. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I think you're right, Mitch. We could do a film. See, I think production wise, we could do it for fifty. But then with post production and and expend yeah. all the other yeah. stuff, I'd say it would any the lowest we did one of these four would be. I would just say all in a hundred thousand to like maybe yeah. yeah. five hundred. Like I think orientation and the what is Scientology film that we shot, those were in the millions. Because yeah, they it was all post production in Los Angeles. Yeah, all the processing yeah. was in Los Angeles. Yeah. All the um, you know, there was a we there was a reshoot after reshoot after reshoot. The sets were big. The we had oh we were renting studios in Los Angeles to shoot orientation. We were renting studios to do yeah, the what is sign. Yeah. So those were, in the early days, we were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars just because we couldn't do it all in in house. We had to hire out stages and, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, but, exactly, um, exactly. But yeah, this is a this is an, a good example of a very large set that we'd have in there. And I'm yeah. gonna say I'm gonna guess just from what I can see right here, this is taking up about half of the studio, if not a no. little bit more. Not even a quarter. Uh, well, no. It, okay. Well, no. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me just read. Look how far around. back we are. No, I'm saying if you're considering the foreground sand and all of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just looking at the little set there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. That's, ha- that's about half. Maybe yeah, yeah, that's I'd say about half because you're using the whole yeah. of the psych wall. The psych wall does take up about maybe a quarter itself. Yeah, but, see, but I was looking at where the camera is, and so I was not considering where the yeah. camera Either is. Either way, this is but a big... yeah. Th- yeah, this is a big good. set for that studio. You're not going to be able to squeeze another yeah. 10 sets in there with this p- yeah, puppy in there. We have some more. So, yeah, there's a. I, I okay. didn't edit these. Oh, yeah. Oh, look was, at th- that. Oh, yeah. That's little... steampunk galore, yeah, man. Yeah, look we, at these guys, yeah. the goggles. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's a good a thing. Cost- steampunk came back in. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a lot easier to put this together. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I didn't really edit these, but we had a really interesting looking. This was, these were all actors we brought in from L.A. So none original, of these are Scientologist actors. No, but see, see the guy, the bald guy with the long hair. Yeah. In, in the previous version, that was Jeff Hawkins played that part. Oh remember yeah, that's Jeff? right, Jeff. Remember? Yeah. That's right. The, so in the in the first time, this film was shot two times because obviously um, Isaac Hayes is no longer around. No, and, but, he, but 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 remember, Isaac shots it was only him. So that's we were able true. To keep all of his shots and scan them at very high resolution digital. Oh, they reused, at, they recycled well, those. We, we kept it, yeah, because it was shot at thirty-five millimeters, so it was super high. Oh, uh, okay. So we were, and plus it was all really was timeless. I mean, it was it happened nowhere. So. That's true, but then, but the kid Johnny, because he unalived himself and yeah. another person, we can't leave him in a Scientology film, right? Right. So and he's in pretty much every single shot of the film without the shots without Isaac. Yeah, exactly. Okay, exactly. so then you guys had it's to reshoot good. it. For, that would I would I would go on to guess that would be the main reason this had to be reshot was because of John. Well, no, that was the only reason. Okay, there you and go. And we were all rejoicing that we could keep Isaac because I mean his shots were. A trend. That's true. I didn't think yeah. about that because his shots are yeah. all standalone. Yeah. And they were all highly, highly, um, you know, by the time. Um, we cut all the things together that to make it sound like he 
did the lines correctly. Right. <laughs> there was a lot of audio editing. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. if he wasn't on screen, we were, it was one of those things that we were using golden era AI, which is where you just take yeah. the, it's like uh, Sal and uh, Richard from the Howard Stern show. They just take an, uh, a person talking and they just cut the word, the individual words out in the audio and then piece got, those together. <laughs> they got really good at that. It was <laughs> they did. <laughs> Well, I mean, the audio edit, the um, editing, the audio editing crew at Golden Era Productions, they were, they'd been editing L. Ron Hubbard um, for decades and using words that he said wrong or mispronounced. They'd steal a word from another lecture. They'd cut out, you know, farts and burps. And sometimes um, they'd cut out both of those at the same time, which if you don't know, <laughs> <laughs> that is called a double flute salute. Or if um, if you listen to the uh, Your Mom's House podcast, it's a uh, I think it's called a double pipe classic. But either uh, way, uh, um, yeah. but if you're in the military, that, like L. Did Ron you, Hubbard next time, was, could you just put those terms up on the screen? So we well, if you're in the military, a a, a, a a double pipe classic is called a dual flute salute. Um, so okay. that's the only difference. Uh, oh, if you're a civilian God. and you fart and burp at the same time, that's a double pipe classic. I just oh, wanted God. to explain the difference. But but what I'm trying, my point is yes, that they point? were good at cutting up these words and replacing and stuff like that. So that's how we ended up getting the uh, Isaac Hayes right. dialogue to work. Right. Um, right. And yes, there were a lot of children in this film that, in both films, yeah, we, we had yeah, children. Yeah, because we needed extras. You know, what kind of a civilization would it be without children? Well, that's called the Sea Org, I think. Uh, we actually got, I want to say we got kids from the ranch when we did the first one. Probably. Because the ranch, I, I think, was still around in, um, in 99 or 2000, around the time yeah, we hey, shot this. Yeah, hey, if you kids who were at the ranch were in the film and are no longer in Scientology, give us a shout. Yeah, that would be amazing. To talk to you. So, yeah, this was me. I think I was hiding my cell phone in my coat when I was doing this. And you were just like, oh, do to do. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we found the world's cutest little blonde girl. Okay, that's the end of, uh, that's the end of those pictures. So. Awesome. And then this also was the, we, I think we told a story about when we were shooting in the desert in Brawley, California. When we, right. um, uh, is it called Brawley? It's Isn't outside of Brawley. It's called the Bra it's called San the Sand Dunes, but I think it's called the Brawley yeah, Sand Dunes. No, it's called Imperial Dunes. Imperial Dunes, and it's right, right. outside of Brawley, California. Yeah, it's where they shot they shot Stargate. Okay. Because because anyway, the, the trailer we were to go to Africa to shoot if you're yeah. to shoot. Well, when the the trailer that we were shooting in the middle of the desert in the Imperial right. Dunes in California right. was the TR five trailer. So all those right. um, people right. that we were marching across the desert were wearing the same outfits, a lot of the same kind of types yeah. of outfits. These people, except they had a lot of um, uh, what do you call them shawls or uh, they had a lot of capes that were covering their body. Yeah, they to, looked to like a nomadic tribe that was yes, traveling but it, across the desert. But it was a little bit of steampunky mixed in with it. Yeah, but what we, what ended up happening was, um, as much as we trouble as we got it, and as much as we struggled to get the shots of the caravan of people, we never used them. We just used the solo shots of Johnny marching through the dunes, struggling to hike through the dunes. So after all of that, after you being almost jailed by the Bureau of Land Management, <laughs> sitting in the back of a BML, BLM cop car with yeah. handcuffs on. <laughs> yeah, you can't really say BLM anymore. You have to say the whole thing because Bureau of Land Management. Yeah, you have to people, BLM. Down there <laughs> oh, that's true. There's there. another. Yeah. There, there was another BL. There, there was only one BLM back then. Yeah, back then, but now there's two. So. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah, that was yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah so that was um i'm trying to think if there was anything else we did um we did well, the isaac stuff we did tommy davis we covered johnny um we covered the trailer that's pretty much yeah. all the stuff yeah, we hold did up, but no there's this one other thing i don't totally remember it the one thing is that um one of the main principles that the film was pushing was this idea of these three these three laws, these three laws of auditing, right? Oh, yeah, and, that's right. And I can't, I can't, basically, this was, there's this book, I believe it's called The Dynamics of Law. That's I right. That is the that, book that this is sort of based, that he uses. Yeah. I think he, he uses that book 
as his sort of blueprint. He holds it up, and then he opens it up, and he reads it, and he shows us these three laws. And these three laws, this makes no sense. Basically, it says the auditor, meaning, you know, the counselor, that their reactive mind is bigger than the preclear, the person being audited, bigger than their reactive mind. And so the idea is that somehow this is broken into three laws, but the, 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 the concluding law is that the auditor plus the PC are bigger than the PC's reactive mind. That's right. Auditor plus PC is bigger than the bank. Yeah, and this is the reason why you have to have an auditor, why you can't audit yourself. Except, but wait a minute, you do audit yourself in Scientology. So I, it's... This was written before Hubbard came up with that part. Yeah, <laughs> which was... A or who given. knows. That's the other yeah. thing about yeah. some of these films is sometimes these films become a policy in Scientology because it's not covered anywhere else in a policy. Right, right. But these were written by L. Ron Hubbard. So they are they have the power of an L. Ron Hubbard policy on how to do something. Right. And they also have the policy of an L. Ron Hubbard bulletin, which right. talks about the 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 Scientology right. technology of auditing or counseling right. or training or whatever. Like elastic team tactics. Yeah. So we, so there was a lot of times where someone would be like, Well, what's that per? And he'd be like, Oh, it's per this film. And you'd be like, Well, you have to show me the film. I'm like, no, no, you have to figure out how to watch the film. I don't have to show yeah. you nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I already know what it says, but um, yeah, you want to uh, you want to see if there's any uh, questions in here? Oh yeah, Ooh, please. there's a, I, we've even got somebody who was there when we shot yeah, it. Yeah, I, I saw that. You have to do that from Amy Scobie. So Amy was over. Amy Scobie um, has a channel here, SPTV Nation, and um, Queen B, Queen B, Queen SP. B, SP. Anyway, Amy Scobie was in the international management. Um, Bureau of Scientology and her job was to oversee the Celebrity Center. So when Isaac Hayes, Isaac Hayes is arguably like one of the top 10 Scientologists, uh, celebrities and Scientologists at the time. So if he's coming to the property with Tommy Davis, a Celebrity Center uh, Sea Org right. member, then right. that's Amy's territory. Yeah, so I, I don't know, just one little thing. I don't know if we made it clear, but any interaction with Scientology celebrities, no matter what it was, any official kind of interaction, all had to go through the president's office at Celebrity Center. And Amy That's correct. was over Celebrity Center. So. Yeah. So this one says, um, I was there when Isaac shot this, saying Earth is not necessarily the most inhabited planet in the universe. But he kept saying inhibited instead. Yeah, that was, the, it was like those, I, that's, ex it's so funny that you say that, Amy, because it was, we mentioned the contractions like let us and let's, but that was another one. He would just transpose a single letter in some of these words, but it would completely change the meaning of the sentence. Right to right. swap that letter. So right. it was instead of saying Earth is not necessarily the most inhabited planet, to say Earth is not necessarily the most inhibited planet in the universe, that's a totally different thing. And so that sentence we'd have to reshoot. And we and we and he we, we he would go he would literally go inhabited, 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 inhabited. And we'd be okay, reset, 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 inhabited, inhabited 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 he would just be saying that over and over yeah and then, and then we'd, we'd all stop and in unison we'd turn and look at tommy yeah like and it was, tf dude that's right you what? you 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 didn't catch that he had been saying inhibited yeah, on the plane first class you yeah like you freaking, know you guys, know <laughs> tommy was sleeping and Isaac was sleeping. That's exactly what they were doing. We all knew. We're like, you really are working lines on a red eye? You slept. You both yeah. slept. Just say you both slept. Don't, why, why pretend? Anyway, but um, yeah. And then we would, he would say inhibited, inhibited, or inhabited, inhabited, inhabited. And then we'd be like, okay, everybody set. Okay. And it, and it was also, we're not moving. We're, we, there was a crane move on Isaac for a lot of these shots. But some were locked off. But for the most part, it was a pretty straightforward shot for us to do. So we would do it so many times, we'd get it. But Isaac, oh, yeah. and then we'd go, okay, good. Da, 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 da. Okay, good. Take three. And then he would go, Earth is not not necessarily the most inhibited planet. And be like, cut. And be like, <laughs> in the universe. And we'd be like, dude, this is, we're going to be here. And literally the crew were just like, we're gonna get we're gonna get so busted. We're gonna be here. Oh yeah, because everybody eventually everybody would be in trouble. 
<laughs> yeah, Everybody. it was just like, what are you doing? It's three pages of dialogue. And you'd be like, yeah, we're doing it a sentence at a time. And we're, it's taking four hours a sentence. <laughs> Um, thank you for that, Amy. Um, Joanna Arcana, that is a lot of gold spray paint. Yes. Um, if you were in the costumes the, or what we what was called the wardrobe department, um, g silver and gold spray paint were your best friends. And dulling spray. Um, yeah. Stephen Britton, these are training films. Yes, these are internal training films either designated by a TR before them, the number, or an EM. If it's a TR, it's a training uh, routine film and if it's a uh, EM it's an e-meter training film did you um, see Mark Catherine Olson she put the actual three three laws in there oh she did she, oh let me yeah, look she actually put them thank you wow Jeff, look at that. this I don't even know how these guys are uh where okay let me look I'm looking now looking at uh, at Queen B is it what's the timestamp? uh it would be 406 your time I found it. There it is. Yeah. So Catherine Olson, thank you for that, Catherine. Mitch, the reactive mind is greater than the PC. The reactive mind is greater than the auditor. But auditor plus PC is greater than the reactive mind. Yeah, that's uh, and exactly. How that, and you see how that binds these three, these two people together. Like, you know, the, you can never, you can't audit without somebody else. So you you you, you really you need this other person. There, there's this great scene where there's these two kind of you know indigenous people on this planet. And for some reason, they have to pick up a huge boulder. Remember that? And one guy is struggling to do it, can't pick it up. That's right. And this other guy comes up, and between the two of them. That's right. That's how, they, that's how they give it. That's the analogy right. or whatever. Two the... people. I mean, come on. It's common sense. Two people, get, in some cases, could get more done than one person. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of, you know, it's like that's kind of the whole point of the thing. <laughs> Yeah, R Riley Reed Slatkin, a.k.a. C.O. Bilf, says, Isaac Hayes and Tommy Davis, I am surprised the cool, uncool polarization on that plane did not cause some sort of cataclysmic rift in space-time. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, that's super funny. Um, Tommy Davis is sort of, yeah, I mean, he kind of carried himself like he was a cool cucumber. But I mean, yeah, he, he had, had the he was wearing these like expensive Italian shirts, you know, suits and. But even with was, all that, even with all that, Tommy Davis brought in about five percent cool well, compared to the, Isaac. Isaac yeah, had. had oh, yeah. Yeah. Isaac was Isaac was overflowing with cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, plus Tom couldn't he couldn't ever get that that indent out of his lip from the silver spoon. Yeah. He was, with it. He was a little like, kind of like trying to hide it. Yeah. But he was always there. It's funny. When Tommy Davis was at the Imp Base, I always considered him like a punk ass kid. Like, oh, he's this punk ass kid. Yeah, like, what's from, he doing here? From Celebrity Center. But it was always sort of like, oh, Tommy Davis, this kid. And then um, I would always refer to him as a kid. Like, the entire oh, time I was there, he acted like a child. And, um, you know, I, I cast it. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I have a funny story about Tommy, but regardless, of, yeah. somebody Sorry. pointed Sorry. out to me at some point, just, uh, like a handful of years ago from now saying, I think Tommy Davis might be older than you. And I was like, <gasps> what? And, wow. and I think he might think? actually be, I don't oh, know. I've never looked it up. I, I I'm going to look it up right now while we're sitting no, here, you know, but, that, um, uh, I don't even know if you can find him. Tommy Davis Scientology. Does he have a Wikipedia? Oh, he does actually. Um, oh, absolutely. He was. The he is older than me. Tommy oh, Davis no. is older than me. Yeah. That's crazy. He is a year older than me. He's a total punk. <laughs> I never. He acted like such a little punk ass bitch the entire time I was in the Sea Org that I always was like, this little punk ass kid. And well, then when they told me. You know, I'm pretty sure he's older than you. I was like, there's no way. And sure enough, there you go. He is. He, um, Mark, Mark, did he ever have a actual post title? Yeah, he was the vice president for Celebrity Center. That was no, but his. I mean, when we used to see him up at Gold. Um, I think he was the vice president for Celebrity Center when was he was it? at Gold. Wow. Or he was um, the there was some sort of wrangler post that was in the president's office that he might have had um 
uh, and then he maybe became the vice the vice president of Celebrity Center. Yeah, when no, he Catherine, became the Catherine, international she, spokesperson, he was the right. international spokesperson of Scientology. Whether I don't know what yeah, that somehow, was internally. Yeah, look at this. There's another comment from Catherine Wilson, four twelve years old. She's right about this because what time? This, so, uh, it's about the same time. Uh, da, 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 about four something, four twelve. Uh, yeah, so yeah, f- uh, twelve year top. She's absolutely right about this. I don't know how where where Catherine got all of her data. It must be because she was in data, but she's right about this. Tommy, he went up when he was put in charge of PR for Scientology. He was str- he was in IMPR, International yeah. Management PR. Thank yeah. you for that, Catherine. Yeah. Well, that was. I mean, that's when. Um... Because he dumped his lovely wife. Remember, he was married to this really very sweet girl from brussels you might not have known this because you were trapped up at the base no no i'm gonna say that this all happened um nadine was her name nadine right yes he um, she wasn't qualified for the base so his perfect little steward wife he's like later we're no longer married and he went up to the base and then he married jessica fishback yeah that all took place after i left so i didn't um, i left in 2000 january 2005 he um I think I want to say in 2004 is when he um, Nadine got in trouble. She was that what uh, yeah. it was? Uh, I'm not even going to say. I because, always picked her. But. Uh, uh, unfortunately, sometimes the information that I have came from when a person gets interrogated, what's called a security check. Right. And then that data is told to another Sea Org member. And then that just becomes like the Sea Org, sea Org's uh, People magazine. And so you hear things <laughs> about different people. No, that is right. it's, the Sea Org People magazine are called Sec Check Knowledge Reports. That's a Sea Org People magazine. Oh, um, cool. And that's where you find out what stuff Mitch did. That's where you find out what stuff uh, Tommy Davis did. Because David Miscavige just reads these things out. Um, at meetings like he likes to know the little uh, picadillos or whatever you call it of the people um, that gets get in inter- interrogated in Scientology right. so the I know that Tommy Davis got in trouble for some stuff really the thing that I was told Tommy Davis got in, in trouble for was um, thinking he was Tom Cruise so he was working as Tom Cruise's handler and he would he would basically be, he would dress like, he'd get the same glasses as Tom. He'd dress right, like Tom. Right. He would be like a little mini Tom Cruise. Yeah, and his wife was Katie's handler, Jessica. And his wife was Katie Holmes's handler. Right. And so the what I was hearing was that um, t- Tommy was becoming more and more powerful just from his connection to Tom Cruise. And then right. he was also... Um, you know, spending money on suits and watches, and and he was sort of becoming his own celebrity in Scientology, right, right. to the point where it was pissing off Tom Cruise. Right. <laughs> like, really? what are you doing? Like, you're 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 like my f- flunky Scientology assistant. You're not me, right? You know, and and and, and Tom has been given, which he is, wasn't is given free cars and pairs from BMW because he has a product placement deal and Mission Impossible. So they're just constantly, I mean, Dave used to say, hey, Tom just got a pair of 850s. You want to borrow one for the weekend? I'm like, no, because I want to bring it back with a sketch. But then Tommy's showing up with the same cars that his dad's bought him that Tom Cruise is being given in free in movies. So it's kind of like, wait a minute. You know, you need yeah. to be driving a Volkswagen, not not a better car than mine. So yeah, yeah. I, I could see how that would be true. Yeah. Um, so, well, let me ask you a question. When did Jason leave? Here? When did Jason leave Scientology? Yeah. yeah. I want to say that. The YouTube thing? Yeah, I'm going to say that was 2007-ish, 2006, okay. 2007-ish. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, Tommy was definitely up there when that happened because I remember right after the, the Jason went on YouTube and did his whole thing, right? Um, yeah, we gotta t- we gotta save this for another video okay, because but, but we will. I'm trying. Was, okay. I'm now tell I'm gonna okay. tell you this, people. If okay. you want Jason Begay on this channel on the Blown for Good channel, <laughs> you're gonna have to hit up Jason on social media on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, wherever you see Jason Begay in social media. You need to hit him up and say you need to go on uh, SPTV on uh, the BFG channel. Um, 
because with Mitch and Mark with Mitch and Mark. Yeah, because yeah. it's going to be kind of hard for me to I'm good friends with Jason. And that's sort of I want to say if you're like a celebrity and you have and somebody else has does something in the in the in the YouTube world, it's sort of like not the most it's I think it's a little gauche of me to be like, hey, can you come on my channel? So um I, that's a it's a weird now it's a weird thing and i've never actually asked jason to do anything like that right. so um i have spoken to him he knows mitch and i are doing this series and he <laughs> yeah. and he may or may not have watched um some yeah. of them but um so yeah we'll see yeah, if we jason can get jason on of, here he was one of the only actors i mean the last time i talked to him was a story we'll tell later at some of the time was when tommy davis walked up to me and said the boss, you know, which people called him sketch, which was really, really disgusting. He wants you to call Jason because you guys are friends, and he he's rumored to be going on the Matt, uh, on the, the Today Show with uh, the interview with Matt Lauer, and we want you to call him. The boss wants you to call him and, t and talk him out of it, right? So, <laughs> and he hands me a recording device. I want you to record the phone call. Blah blah blah. blah. I'll tell you the whole story. I'll tell you right now. I did not. Re I did not record the phone call. For yeah. Two reasons. One is illegal, and the other <laughs> was I. St I still consider Jason my friend, even though he left, because I didn't give a shit that he left and spoke out about Scientology. That's his right to do so. Um, yeah. So I just had to be quiet about that. So, but anyway, yeah, that's that's we'll we'll, we'll do that sometime. Nice. Hannah Reynolds says, well, now I know why so many ex-COS people are gingers. They were actively recruited by <laughs> Mitch's films. Yeah, no, there no, were a that, lot of ginger. This had yeah, a high kid, ginger content. No, but that kid, well, no, I don't think that had anything to do with it because we did so much stuff uh, with, you know, L. Ron Hubbard throughout his life. I'll pull. I'll find. I have some. Oh, tools. that's true. Well, that's but that's true. Yeah. L. Ron Hubbard was a ginger, so the gingers are already like, oh, that's my guy. Yeah, but we didn't ever. I never remember casting somebody because they were a ginger like Elrond. Oh, I know, but Lee Purcell, never, ginger. Yeah, but this we showed a somebody, bunch of gingers in these pictures. Really, I didn't notice. But some of some of the people yeah. thought that the kid maybe he wasn't a ginger. The star no, thing. but some of these other look, dude, look these people. They got all kinds of gingerness okay. in here. Look at this. Let's see. Let's, yeah, I uh, guess I he does look like a ginger there. Yeah, he bit. does with that lighting, oh, and also whoa, the gal looks yeah. like a ginger. She, d no, you're right, right. Maybe Hubbard. I, oh yeah, never mind. Yeah, yeah he's come on, the, dude. Yeah, yeah, no. I, Johnny didn't look that gingery. No, Johnny was blonde. Yeah, but I don't either know way, why they did this? This is weird. Yeah, okay. Yeah, got some high ginger content I don't even, there. Yeah, it is. No, you're right. <laughs> you're right. It's like a copper tone ad. Okay, this is the last one we got. It's from uh, okay. Reed. Riley Reed Slatkin, a.k.a. C.O. Bilth. Full OTs do not have asthma. Yeah, tell that to David Miscavige. David Miscavige has an oxygen tank under his desk. Um, yeah. yeah, no. Um, let me just look through the comments in here. Um, uh, Denver Stevo. Let's get Jason Begay here. If not for Mark and Mitch, let's do it for Denver Stevo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, shit. Great. Yeah, there you go. Way Plan to get the way to get the troops behind you there, Denver. <laughs> um, Catherine Olson says, "Mark, you're crazy about gingers too." Nah, just one in particular. That's yeah. all. Well, um, I'm not really a big fan of, of uh, hub tart, um, <laughs> but yeah, there is a lot of um, there are a lot of gingers uh, floating around. I there. Uh, there's a thing about gingers being a um, a recess. Is it called a recessive res, receding recessive gene? Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's true. I think that I I see a lot of gingers. I see way more than right. this recessive gene uh, propaganda they're trying to spread around. I call them daywalkers. They steal souls. If you haven't seen the South uh, South Park episode about gingivitis, <laughs> you need to get on that. Um, gingivitis. Anyway, um, let's do um, let's do. Uh, Make sure we take care of all the. Uh, if you if you're watching on the Blown for Good channel, um, hit on over to Mitch's channel at Scientology the Big Lie. Um, I saw that new trailer for your book. Oh yeah, I did a cover reveal. Yeah, it's good. Yes, huh? very cool. Yeah, very cool. I, if you I haven't seen it, go over to go over to Mitch's channel. There's a a, a trailer a, a cover reveal. Yeah. Uh, for uh, Mitch's book, Scientology, The Big Lie, uh, how he made the uh, evil cult look good. Is that what it is? Is that what the yeah, tagline? Yeah, you got it. You got okay, it. Okay, perfect. How I made an evil cult look good. That's very good, Mark. 
I um, also have the, the merch store is live and the nice. And, yeah, it, it, it hasn't shown up on YouTube yet because I need to make sure that I'm not, you know, making you know, uh, so, you know, something weird. Uh, trying to sell it on there or something. Weird. Yes, they don't, they want to make sure there's no scams in there. But yeah, if you haven't uh, subscribed to Mitch's channel, head on yeah, over thank there you and for subscribing by the way, like and subscribe, um, all that good stuff, um, and. Um, yeah, it says Mark probably sees lots of gingers as he looks for them. No, I don't look for them. I, they do stand out though, and I have a little um, chest plate for to make sure they can't steal my soul if I get near them. And my right. kids know to cover their souls if we see them, like in the supermarket or in the mall or something. My my children know how right. to be prepared. Um. Anyway, um. Yeah, check out Mitch's channel, and um. And what are we gonna do next? What films do you want to do next, Mitch? Let's give everybody a uh, an idea. It what which up. one should we do? We well, did EMA. We did. Yeah I'm, um, to, yeah, I'm trying to think which ones we have. Let me look at the note here. Yeah, we've got a bunch left, guys, and we've been covering oh, yeah. them. We've been kerchunking through them. Um, but I'm trying to think of another one. I want to save the ones that we could, if we could possibly do get Jason on here, we will do, um, there's one or two films that we could do cover with him that he did, had like a major part in, like he was the main yeah. star of. Yeah. Well, one, he did, uh, he, he stars throughout the whole film, which is the session. Yeah. TR 13. Uh, TR 13, the session. And then another one, EM one man the unfathomable yeah it's one of the words you have to say slowly or you'll never say it right there was a picture you sent me i god i wish i had it we'll show it well i promise we'll show it on the next film or the next video we do when we did a film when we finished all of the films mm -hmm. when we did so there's all these tr films and there's all these em films that l ron hubbard wrote and in the history of scientology no one had ever produced all of them and that well, was our job was to produce all of the right. technical training films and right. get them all done just as L. Right. L. Ron Hubbard had directed. And um, when we did that, they uh, we got a big award and we got given bunch um, of shit. We got you know given a bunch yeah. of swag. <laughs> yeah. We got big. We spent we spent decades producing these films. They gave us a three hundred dollar jacket, and on wow. the jacket. Depending on how many films you'd worked on, you got a patch. Right. And the funny thing about that TR-13 film is when I escaped, they kept my jacket with <gasps> all my patches. And I had no. worked on and I had worked on every single film. You were film. one of the only people that got more than a few patches. I had worked on you every single all. film, either as an actor, as a manufacturing or as the shoot crew chief, or as the pre-production director, or as the producer, in some way or another, I had worked on just about every single film. Right. And they kept my jacket and all my patches, but one of the patches was messed up, and so I got a different, I got a replacement patch for that film, and it was yeah. TR-13, and somehow, Man. I have that patch to this day, I still have the patch. But, um, but Mitch, um, has a photo of all of the patches. I do for Actually, all the films. This is the one. This is the. This is the. Well, it's not going to get close enough to be. Oh, it's going to yeah. be by my face. Yeah. Which one's that's that? The, that's the one for the film we did tonight. That's um, white TR five. Yes. Yeah, white TRs. And then this is the one for TR TR thirteen. We yeah, that's about. the one I have. Yeah. I have them all here. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Anyway, we'll show those, and. Um, Maybe we could do, there, right? maybe do, there. well, let's do, let's maybe do a picture, a, an ECU of each one. And then that way we can really get some detail on them. Yeah. Okay. I'll do that. I'll show Yeah. Some of them are hideous. Extreme yeah. close up for you, not uh, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. industry. ECU yeah. is extreme close up. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the tone I scale. I'm wear film. my jacket. I'll wear it next time. Yeah. I, you know, cause I have my jacket. But it doesn't have the patch. It doesn't have any patches sewn no, on it. No, because I thought it looked really tacky. Yeah, well, if I would have thought the same, I'd have all the patches and no jacket. But I don't have the jacket, and I don't have the patches. Can't believe, I mean, it, it's a nice jacket if you like Letterman jackets. I mean, you know. Again, I have the exact know, same one, but a Depeche Mode one. 
Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that I had custom made for myself. Yeah, I mean, I wasted 30 years of my life and you know, I got this lousy jacket. So, you know. It's That's like, a good thing. I mean, it's better yeah. than nothing. They took all my photos. They took all my stuff. Yeah. They took anything that had anything to do with Scientology. They kept that and they sent me all the other stuff. But for some yeah. weird reason, they sent me this single patch by itself. I was like, oh, what's this? I didn't even know I had this. Anyway. That's enough. It's been an hour and a half. We need to end this thing. Yeah, um, okay. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, if you hit, uh, if you haven't liked and subscribed, that would really help us out um, and uh, get this out to more people. Um, we will figure out what our next film is, and we will get that one um, going. And then um, tomorrow, if you're watching this live, um, it's uh, the beginning of November and we are doing a, a, a bunch of videos tomorrow, which is Friday, and we're doing a bunch of videos on Saturday because that's when um, they're going to have this big Scientology event and, a, and, a, and also a Scientology protest in England at the, uh, the Advanced Organization of St. Hill in um united kingdom so uh more to come can't, can't wait can't wait there'll be all kinds of excitement happening with that and um there might even be some osa nonsense that might happen i'm pretty sure um there's going to be nonsense if it's osa or just scientology regular old plain old scientology nonsense there will be nonsense i guarantee you um and we'll tell you about it so um thanks for joining us thanks to everybody who's here till the very end and we will see you next time